we're here for the journey, but you have to get on the road to recovery. Red Lodge Transition Program is a grassroots organization. There's no other organization around like us that helps men and women transition back from being locked up in prison or incarcerated in jail back to the community. So one of the things we do is we help help them transition by setting up with a good program for them to strive and move forward. And I became a part of Red Lodge years ago because of, well, for many, many years, actually I've been doing work in the prisons for a lot of years. And one of the things that we know, of course, is a lot of our native people are in prisons more, more often than not for drug or alcohol related crimes. I was in the seventh grade, so I was about 13 or 14 years old when I first was introduced to alcohol. About 13. 13. I was in NARA at the age of 15. I was 17 when I first started using drugs. So that makes it really, really difficult sometimes to, you know, get out of prison and stay out of prison. So Red Lodge was important to, to build and create in order for, to have a vehicle for Native people, just particularly women, to get out of prison and stay out of prison. Prior to uh, coming to prison, about three and a half, four years before, um, I was on methadone for those years and uh, I had started doing cocaine prior to my incarceration. After having my baby, I ran into some difficulties in the unhealthy relationship that I was in and I started drinking and that led me down a different path of bringing me to prison. I was doing, um, actually my, my sister died of breast cancer and I was clean and sober at the time and I made a choice to get involved in, with the wrong people and I got loaded and the consequences were I came to prison and I lost my kids. Recidivism is extremely high in Native families and I was drawn to the work of Red Lodge because we need to fight that culture and that cycle of incarceration that runs through our families. A 20-year-old child and a 3-year-old grandchild. Um, I'm a single mom. I have three younger children. My oldest daughter lives with her dad and my two youngest uh, kids are adopted. I have two children. I have a daughter right now that's the age of 16 and I have a son that's eight years old. Um, when I left, my daughter was nine and my son was 15 months old. There was a time period that I didn't get to see my kids for almost three years. It's really about the journey home. It's about the journey home in the physical sense for our people, but it's also about the journey home in the cultural sense. I think cultural healers, if we allow it to, the dances, the ceremonies, the songs, will heal us if we allow it to. The Me Red Lodge is, means uh, spirituality. Um, they did a lot for me. The women from Red Lodge came in and they brought ceremonies into me. When I first came in here, uh, I found out about Red Lodge and they have been so supportive. It's helped my spirit grow tremendously and that is something that is very important to me. I think without a strong spirit that I would just be completely lost and I would have had no focus. So it's going to help me stay on what we refer to as the Red Road. It's going to be a very important part of my recovery and a part of my life for, for the rest of my life. At our spring celebration, uh, there was a, um, a spiritual moment or awakening, if you will, uh, because I was so depressed and so angry. But the, the drum, the singers, and just the spiritual movement at that time, uh, my tears began to fall, and uh, it, they would not stop, and so it was a, a deep cleansing for me. And, that was the beginning of a little journey for me. Red Lodge in my life has been a huge part of my recovery process and they helped me to become the person I am today so that I can function in society and in the community. I have now over five years clean and sober. I've been out of prison for two years um, and uh, I have almost six years clean. Red Lodge is a holistic program. Uh, we 
are working at a grassroots level, but we're ready to go to the next step. And the next step is to provide housing for these women, a, a house that can mentor uh, our women and, and, and teach them what they need to know. For me. And without that, I don't think that I would have made it. She helped me build my connection with Creator. Aside from the spring celebrations and the uh, smudgies and the talking circles and the parenting classes and the sweat lodges and everything else that they do for us, um, she was able to contact, have contact with me when I was in segregation for those two years that I spent in the home. And um, it was awesome. Without that, I, don't, I know that I wouldn't be. I want to be live today. to Native Nations, our February program. I'm David Liberty, your host from the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation. Welcome and thank you for watching. We have guests here tonight from the Red Lodge Transition Project. And to my far right here, we have Mr. Ed Edmo. Hello. <laughs> and you're on the board of directors, yeah, as I understand. Six years, yes. yes. And Karma, I forgot your last name, Karma. Corcoran. Karma Corcoran. And Millie, and what's your last name, Millie? Wall, Millie Wall. Millie Wall. Okay. okay, well, each of these people is gonna tell us a little bit more about Red Lodge. And um, if you've been a native person and in the uh, state prison system, you know how difficult it is to make the transition coming out back into the uh, civilian life. Red Lodge is a program to help you make that transition from prison back into the uh, population. So Ed, we're gonna start with you and give us a little background about Red Lodge and tell us what you do. I'm on the board of director of Red Lodge. I'm an ex-con also. I burglarized a church in 1965. Don't burglarize a church in Oregon. Oh. They throw the bucket you, they gave me two years I was an OSCI and did 50 months in 20 days, flat on my time out, and I got this uh, officer to look like a pig. I give you a year, you'll be in the big house. I had the avenue of staying in the stupa for I never went back. I don't advise that, staying in the stupa for a year, but I never went back. Now I'm out there to help the people to come out of the penitentiary, the men and women come out of the penitentiary, because I didn't have anything like that for me. Yeah, well, that experience for you would I'm sure that would really help relating to the other prisoners yeah. and what they need and what you can do to help. I didn't know that you were a former prisoner, yes, Ed. Yes. Thanks for coming out on our show tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was young and stupid and, and alcohol and drugs, and uh, I've since cleaned up my act and um, don't do alcohol and drugs today. Uh, but I think, I think people need to find out our culture will heal us <laughs> when we allow it to. What we're doing is bringing culture and religion and our ceremonies into the women's penitentiary, men's penitentiary. Mm -hmm. I conduct sweats in Eastern Oregon, Pendleton, Two Rivers, OSP. I've been Great. Doing that. My son and I went in three weeks ago to Oregon State Penitentiary and he sang songs. Well, I almost ended up in prison, Ed. My best friend burned down the police station in John Day the weekend I was out of town. Or I would have been right there with yeah. him. I mean, it was, no. I just happened to be gone when he decided to burn the, the police station down. But he ended up serving five years. Yeah. And he was a Hispanic, mm -hmm. a good friend of mine, and learned how to be a barber and came out. And now he's a professional barber, making a good name for himself. I learned how to do photography in prison. It's been having such a photo, just touched the camera since the volcano went off. I have 35 millimeter Pentax camera, 1,000. I haven't touched it since the volcano went out, but that's what I learned in prison. Oh. Yeah. Well now, for Red Lodge, what kind of duties, besides the 
you lead the sweat, she said. Mm -hmm. And um, do you have any personal counseling time or something like that with prisoners? What I like about Red Lodge is we're going to Cobb Creek, the women's penitentiary now. We're doing like an eight, 12 week course on suicide prevention. I spoke last Monday night on suicide prevention. Good. We have women with issues of depression, PTSD, uh, family violence. I was raised with a lot of violence as I was growing up. It seemed like we always had some woman walking at the door got beat up or something, be that stepsister or auntie no. or whatever. That's what I was raised, so we're reaching out to help these women to overcome those issues. Mm -hmm. And it's the same group, core people. We picked 12 women that we targeted have these issues so we come speak every week. Oh, great. Well, that sounds like a good work, Ed, and it's all volunteer, right? Oh, yes, not yes. Getting yeah. paid for this. No. Yeah, it's out of the goodness of your heart. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, Karma, let's move to you, and we'll get back to you, Ed. If you've got <laughs> something to say, interject at any time. Okay, okay? good. Feel okay. free. Karma, how, what do you do for Red Lodge? I'm the board chair, and so I uh, work with Trish Jordan in particular to try and reach the goals that we want to reach in uh, all of our different projects, uh, try to help organize the volunteers, the events. And I've been fortunate to be involved in the healing workshop that Ed was talking about. And these women we knew had some real issues. And we went to the Department of Corrections last June and asked them if we could hold workshops for these specific group of women. And these women spend a great deal of time cycling in and out of segregation. Mm -hmm. And I think the system would maybe even call them incorrigible. But we felt like we could offer them healing. So we designed a workshop that runs 12 weeks. Um, I'm very transparent with the women and everyone too in that it also benefits me. I happen to be working on my PhD, and so this is part of my PhD research. And so each week we discuss a different topic. We bring in presenters. So one of the topics we had recently was historical trauma. And I'm using a theory called gentle action uh, as part of my research. So it involves providing the information, some different tools that they might use, so we don't go in and say, now you have behavioral problems, you have anger problems, you have this, you have that. Instead, we bring up these subjects, and we talk about them, and then we offer different tools that they can use. Uh, so we just had our fourth week. We have women, apparently, who have already signed up on a waiting list. Wow. Should we hold it again? We are already seeing that it's working. So for example, one of the young women that we work with has been in there a very long time. Mm -hmm. And she had something that happened. And so she shared that in the past, with this disagreement with another inmate, that she would have gotten angry. She probably would have maybe even punched them and ended up in the hole. But instead, just in this few weeks, she learned that she needed to step back and what she did was she did huge things. She identified her feelings. She was angry. She was upset. Her feelings were hurt. She decided to choose a different action than she had chosen before. Very good. She examined her feelings about it, which was in the past it would have been, it's my way or the highway, you better agree with me. And while she doesn't agree with this person, she now can acknowledge that they're going to have to agree to disagree about this. Mm -hmm. She was able to examine the relationship. It's somebody that she does respect, that she's friends with. Um, and another wonderful aspect was she went and um, spent time with one of her sisters in the circle. And they process it. It's a sister that she trusts and respects. And so already she's learning a different way of handling things, where in the past she would have been perfectly happy to have a physical altercation with this other inmate and end up in segregation for three months. Yeah. And so it's <laughs> fabulous. Um, and I think that we're doing everything from suicide prevention to anger management, 
um, behavioral modification, getting in touch with family of origin issues, mm -hmm. drugs and alcohol, domestic violence, uh, and then learning how to set barriers and have healthier relationships. So it's a lot of work for, to prepare for 12 weeks, but we've been so fortunate to have a lot of people in the community. Uh, Healing Feathers from PSU is coming on over uh, that Great. are willing to come on in and do a um, presentation. It's a two-hour workshop every Monday night. So it's a good amount of time with the women. And we had three new people last week um, from the original 12 that we invited. Another three heard about it and wanted to join in. Great. So it's good work. All right. Hey, Karma, I want to uh, <coughs> mention, and for each of us here, I want to give our tribal affiliation. Yes. What tribe are you from? I'm Chippewa Cree, and so I'm from Rocky Point, Montana. Mm -hmm. And Ed? I'm Shoshone Bannock, enrolled nest person Yakima. Uh huh. And Millie? Um, my name's Millie Wall, and I'm Klamath and Modoc, uh -huh. and enrolled with the Klamath tribe. All right. I'd like to add what we bring in to Coffee Creek is a spring celebration. The women really look forward to it. We bring in the traditional foods, the salmon, the huckleberries, the roots, and we have, in both sites, we have a washout service where we sing Indian worship songs. The women come out and sit on the ground and we serve the salmon. They really look forward to it. Oh, when yeah. you're when you're I missed being there and they really everyone missed me. So where were you last year? I was on the road working. <laughs> and that's really fulfilled their need to get part of the culture, prayers and traditional foods and that's what the women really look forward for. And access to their elders. Um, they so appreciate. We have a lot of people that come from Warm Springs. We have volunteers from all over that come on in. And I think Millie can even tell us a little bit about um, when she was in, what those things meant to her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you want to talk about your time in, Millie? Yeah. And what, how Red Lodge helped you make the transition? Yeah, well, like what really what happened was about eight and a half years ago, um, I was once again incarcerated for the 13th time. And um, and when I came to Coffee Creek, I was sentenced to 35 months. So at that time when I came in there, I was um, in, 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 in part of my life, I was in this crossroad of wondering or not wondering just thinking now what is it going to be what am I going to do you know knowing I had that choice you know to be in the positive or the negative and I was uh, I was very blessed to be able to come across Trish and um, I was um, I was introduced to her and um, and all these ceremonies and things <clears throat> spiritual things that were happening there within um, Coffee Creek and uh, you know that I could be involved in some of these things you know and I and I was pretty lost in my spirit I was lost you know just you know uh, being down on myself for once again here I come back into prison you know forgetting about how that affects my family and uh, so uh, what helped me was when I when I when I got there and so with Trish and them and everything that they offered there, they offered, you know, um, I got spirituality, you know, and I think what benefited me the most was the ceremonies itself and um, the service that Trish did, you know, um, it, our, the services and everything, the ceremonies were very regular, you know, it's not like you had to sit and wait, she was consistent about coming there. and. Uh, and through this time, you know, got to meet other people, you know, and we had a bunch of Native girls, you know, just like, you know, um, we're encouraged and inspired because of this, you know, knowing that this, you know, taking this opportunity to, to connect to something that was big, you know, the spirituality and knowing that, you know, we had that choice. And during that time, you know, being, um, being a part of the ceremonies or I was able to develop some respect for myself and have respect for other people. And um, I only served 13 months of that and went to boot camp, you know, and I went to boot camp. But once again, like any time I've ever been to prison or jail, you know, or treatment, I always would go back home to Kama Falls. And, um, and nothing's wrong about home there, but there was this always been that big barrier of housing, you know, recovery-based things. and. Uh, so the last time 
you know, I didn't have no option to where to go. Um, there was no transition houses. There was no, you know, Oxford houses. There was nothing. So what I was told, you know, I was supposed to go to the mission. So uh, that's where I went. And um, I let that help me the best it could. But once again, I grasped into something with my own tribe, you know. They were, you know, unfortunately, they were unable to have any kind of housing or have anything like that. Hmm. But at that time there, we had uh, CADA, which is a drug and alcohol program. And uh, so I kind of, you know, I just grabbed onto that. And um, I ended up working for CADA for a while. But that, all that stuff, you know, kind of went away from me. And um, I ended up going back to prison. You know, I well no, I was gonna know I actually went to treatment. So what I did was I came up here to Portland because I remember going to the program, you know, where there was natives and, and I went there and I knew that if I stayed up in Portland that uh you know, and not go back home that I had hope, you know. Um so I stayed up in Portland and what I did after treatment, you know, I knew that there was a big Native community and I knew that there was some services and that there were other people, you know, strong people. Um, so I looked, I searched all that stuff and um, I let myself be a part of, uh, you know, other organizations and lick, you know, listen to what they have to offer. And, and, and I happened to be at a powwow and I ran across Trish again, you know, and at that time when I was talking to her, they had a stand and what it was, it was for Red Lodge. and. And uh, she was telling me about how this prison art project, you know, and what that vision and dream, and it put me back the eight and a half years ago when I met her, you know, and all it was was, yeah, you know, there was this vision and this dream, you know, to have, you know, for women that were coming out of prison, and how, you know, if, if we had that, you know, we could help our, 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 our sisters and stuff, and I was like, how, how, how awesome that was because I, I, I know what it was like, you know, and uh, so I became a client, not only, you know, I became a client <coughs> and a friend and a supporter of Red Lodge and, uh, you know, and part of that part was being my part and giving back to the community, you know, so I've, I've been really blessed to be able to sit here and to be on, you know, behalf of what they've offered me, you know, I've gotten things, you know, I have some some mentors you know I have other people you know and I'm in another program too but it's no less than what it is but you know this is where I wanted to be also was to be a part and help support that and you know and ask for people to help be a supporter of this you know that everybody can be a part of this vision and this dream because I know that I have other sisters that are still incarcerated that when they come back you know that there's always that chance you know, what if we go back? You know, why not if we plant the seed now? You know, encourage them. You know, I'm a mentee, you know, but I still have that message. You know, and I have that. I have that because of the spirituality and the ceremonies. Mm -hmm. so, Very good. Yeah. Well, how many, how many people are involved? Or like how many prisoners come to the events that Red Lodge puts on? Quite a few. Um, it's, it's important to note, too, that while we, our primary objective is to serve the Native women incarcerated, mm -hmm. so there's just the one women's prison, we mm -hmm. do do outreach to the men's prison, too. Uh, for example, we try mm -hmm. to do some workshops each year on historical trauma, domestic violence at some of the men's prisons. We um, support things like the Lakota Club. We go to their powwows where they can, and when the men come out, we are a resource referral for them, and we're encouraging them to build community among themselves, too, mm -hmm. because part of the key aspect of our work is intervention. We're trying to come against this cycle of incarceration that runs so deeply through our people. Yeah. And so when we're in the prison, we have a huge turnout when we go to things for, the, like, the spring celebration, um, it's done on both the minimum security side and the medium security side of the women's prison, Coffee Creek. And it, we could have up to 100 women on each side come wow. to that spring celebration. And one of the reasons, too, that we designed this workshop was we were finding that so many of our women weren't getting to attend 
that really needed it and they seem to always be in segregation at that time mm -hmm. and some of that system orientated and some of that's inmate orientated yeah. so we decided you know what can we do because these women need the celebration they need the sweats they need the talking circle um, so we have a really great uh, number of people who come on out some of the women I mean they look forward to it all year long mm -hmm. this is their one opportunity when community as a whole comes in and you know we might bring in 30 or 40 volunteers with us Wow! and so they are yeah. thrilled to see their elders and their community yeah. members and mm -hmm. you know they drum for us and mm -hmm. Ed tells stories yeah. they love that oh I'm sure and we yeah. usually have a little time left over where they we can dance for a little bit and Good. it's just a spiritual revitalization for them yeah and great. it's it's good work yeah, a very necessary mm -hmm. uh, work. The the needs of the prisoners are a lot more than what we've got here out in mm -hmm. civilization. I mean, it's tough to be in prison. I had a close relative who was incarcerated recently yeah. and was visiting every month. It was real eye-opening for me to go into OSP and then <laughs> Columbia River Correctional <laughs> Institute. Mm -hmm. And it was not something I want to do regularly, yeah. but it really gave me yeah. a good vision of what's happening. And we reached to many of the, the prison sites in Oregon. We have men going to the to Ontario to Two Rivers, Nematella. We have a Deer, Law, Deer Ridge. We have people going in and conducting ceremonies for the men inside. So yeah. Also, for the church I attend, the Willisha Native American Fellowship. In the basement we have a clothing closet for men and women. People getting out of the penitentiary because got one set of clothes and, uh, and that's it yeah you know they don't have getting out you don't have a, a lot of stuff I was given fifty dollars in a set of clothes and hit the door yeah you know yeah. and now we have a clothing closet set up for for men and women also and we also I mean we have had Trisha's picked up people with all that they have as the clothes on their back and maybe yeah. their family had put some money on their card but the system has fined them and so they have a dollar. They don't even have enough for a bus ticket. Yeah. So Trish will talk a little bit later just about that direct client service okay. that we offer, uh, okay. which is huge. Good. Well, we are gonna move on. I know there's more to be said, you guys, but we only have a limited amount of time. So we're gonna take a little break here and hear from John Trudell. And then we're gonna come back with some other guests to talk more about Red Lodge and the work they do. And we'll have a couple more clients of Red Lodge and another official, if she's here. She is here. Yes, I she's here, good, Hill. okay. Mm -hmm. So we'll be back in about 10 minutes after hearing, stick around, listen to John Trudell. I spend, I spend a great deal of time kind of just wondering. Because sometimes, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in a reality See, to me, it's a technologic perceptional reality that we're in. And the technologic perceptional reality has created like an illusion of what reality really is all about and what true value, what reality is really all about. But the illusion, see, and, and we've been programmed into the illusion, see, to me. And it's a way of separating us from our, the reality of power. But anyway, we're in a technologic perceptional reality, right? And this technologic, in this technologic percep perceptional reality, it's, to me, it's like the human beings no longer remember that they're human beings. They, I mean, because they can say the word doesn't mean they know what it means or understands what it means. See, so in a way, it's like we're in a reality where nobody really knows who they are anymore. They don't really understand the language that they're speaking. You know, uh, they have no memory of an ancestral past, so they have no, they have no memory of beginning. They have no beginning memory. You know, and they basically feel powerless to deal with the realities that this technologic perceptional reality imposes upon them. And, and it's like... And this whole thing that happens, all right, it to me is done deliberately, is deliberately done. It's deliberately, deliberately done to us as a part of a civilizing process. 
I think we're being, all right, let's go back to who we are. Because I think it's important that we understand who we are. We are human beings. Human being. Human, the visible, visible being, the invisible, visible. Human. The DNA of the human, the bone, flesh, and blood of the human is literally, made, it's made up of the metals, minerals, and liquids of the earth. So we are literally shapes of the earth. We are just earth forms. <laughs> that's the human, that's the human, rea that's the reality. That's the human reality. We are earth forms. And all things of the earth have the same DNA, the same, you know, the flesh, bone, flesh, and blood is different shape, different form, but it's all the same. We all come from this reality of earth. So the earth truly is our mother, truly. Now, the invisible, visible, the being part, and we all know we have being because <laughs> we know. <laughs> you know, so, so we know we have it. But being comes from our relationship to the sun and the sky and the universe, the being. You know, the moon, just the planets, everything that's in the universe, our being, the being part, that spirit part of us is connected to that relationship to reality. The sun, the sun literally is our father, like the mother literally is our mother because the, light, the rays of light that come from the sun, this is the sperm that gives life to the womb that earth represents. See, so our connection to reality and the reality of power is through having an understanding about our relationship to who we really are. Being able to recognize ourselves. But we don't recognize ourselves. See, and I'm saying, you know, to me it's like, see, it was deliberate, it's a deliberate thing. It's not an accident, it's a deliberate thing. So let's go back to our relationship to reality with the earth as the mother. The bone, flesh, and blood of the earth that's called uranium, the bone, flesh, and blood that is called uranium, you can take that uranium with the technologic reality and put it through a mining process and convert the being part of that DNA, that bone, flesh, and blood into a form of energy. You can do it with fossils. Take the fossils out, put them through the mining process, convert the being part of that into a form of energy. Well, to make civilization run, all right? The being part of human is being mined through the human. And this all has to do with perceptional reality. So as human beings, we live with a natural reality encoded in the DNA through genetic memory, but we also live with an imposed <laughs> illusion of reality. Like dividing in things. It's <laughs> We understand that if you take the uranium and you put it through this mining process, as a result of this, there is toxic waste and poison. We understand that. <laughs> you know, fossils, we understand that. There's toxic waste, there's toxic and poison as a result of this. Well, mining the being part of human also leads toxic and poison. See, every fear, doubt, and insecurity that we have, all right, this is the toxic and the, in, the, the poison that is left over from the mining process. This is the pollution of our consciousness, all right? This is, our, this is the pollution of our relationship to the reality of self. See, so there's a result to all this because all things remain consistent. But as human beings, so anyway, as human beings, we have encoded in our, it's encoded in the DNA. It's like a genetic memory. And encoded in the DNA of every individual human being, and therefore in a collective manner also, all right, is the experience of our individual lineage from our very beginning. It's just there. <laughs> it's just there. And within that, there is a genetic memory. But we have been programmed in such a way that we can't access. See, uh, the more civilized we become, the less our ability to access this information because it's almost like knowledge. It's inherent knowledge that comes from an ancestral relationship to reality. But we get separated from that knowledge. You know, like, so like, because a part of, the, a part of, the, of what civilizing does, the way that it works, the technologic civilizing process, the way that it works, is it erases the memories of the civilized. See, in the memory, and in the memories of the civilized, they forget that they had ancestors. See, they, can go, they go back maybe a couple, two or three generations, remember that, you know? And the memory that they have as well, they were a worker here, or they were a farmer, or they were struggling and starving. And, but they have no memory of, of an ancestry in an evolutionary sense. That, in, that introduced some kind of a, a perception of reality that was clear and balanced. See, that memory's been erased. 
But, but within our genetic memory, what's through instinct, intuition, whatever, within our genetic memory, see, we have a common collective memory. And that common collective memory is that we are all the descendants of tribes. Each and every human being comes from a tribe. Each and every human being is the descendant of a tribe. And in, within, that rea in, within that reality, back in our ancestral memory, see, we knew that we were the children of the earth. We knew that. And we knew that we were borrowing the present from the past and we were borrowing it from the future also. So we knew we didn't own it. We knew that whatever was going on here, we were just kind of, our purpose and our, our purpose was to keep balance, keep human balance so that it doesn't distort the rest of the natural world. So our, that was our purpose, was to keep, keep in balance the human participation because the human participation in its own way is very deadly to the natural world. It, it, it can, it, you know, it brings its own disease. It's a disease perceptual reality. Then the earth gets attacked. It's like cancer eating something. You know, so, so we understood in our genetic tribal ancestry that our purpose in life was to keep the balance. To keep the balance. It wasn't about winning and losing. It wasn't about, it was about keeping the balance. And because we understood we were borrowing from the past and we were borrowing from the future. Because we understood that all things had spirit. We were a part of a spiritual perceptional reality. And, as, as, and, and the, the way that manifested in the, hum, in the behavior of the tribe, uh, of the tribal ancestor, the way that manifested was they knew that life was about responsibility. The human being and the, the participation of the human being in this reality is about responsibility. See, they understood this. So they knew who they were. They knew what they were saying. They knew <laughs> they were whole. Hey, we are back, and look at this beautiful set we have here with all these pictures from the Red Lodge Art Project. Is that what you would call it, Trish? It is the Native American Prison Art Project. Prison Art Project, yes. Welcome back. We have three new guests for the second half of our program tonight. Lincoln, to my far right. Lincoln, what tribe are you from? Klamath tribe. Klamath? Yes. And Trish, what tribe are you from? Creek. My father's Miccosukee. I grew up in the Northwest. Oh, okay. And Johnny, how about you? Um, Warm Springs. Oh, very good. Now we're going to start with Trish because you're kind of the head of the organization. And I don't know if you heard all that we said the first half of the show, but tell us about yourself and what you do for Red Lodge. Well, um, my name is Trish, and I am the executive director for Red Lodge Transition Services. I am one of the founders of the organization. I've been working with women in prison for um, over 12 years as a religious service volunteer. Mm -hmm. And so I was going into the prisons, and we have all these ladies that are getting ready to release, and they're saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know where I'm going to go. Right. And that just broke my heart. And um, a lot of the folks that we work with in the community have relatives or maybe they've been incarcerated themselves. And so we sat down in 2006 and we're like, we, we can do this. We're running programs now. We have education. We should create a transition program for our Native people. And it was such a huge endeavor. We're like, well, where do we even start? And so we're like, well, we need to start with our women because the women have less resources than the men. And our goal is to have a transition house for our Native women. Very good. Yeah, so you have to get funding, and that's going to be a lot of work. Have you uh, have a house in mind, or are you just still dreaming about getting one? Well, we actually had two architects that designed the Red Lodge for us as a capstone project, and Good. it's a beautiful building. It's a, a green building. You know, our, my vision, a lot of our visions is to have a place out in the country where we can have a lodge, we can have some land, we can grow our own food, mm -hmm. and allow that, uh, that earth to help 
the healing process. Sure. Um, over 70% of the women that we work with do not have housing to return to, so they get put in temporary housing in downtown Portland, or they go back to the Mission in Klamath Falls. 70%? 70% wow. of all of our women are going to um, emergency shelters. And, and that doesn't last forever. You know, they're supposed to find a job. They're supposed to find a place to live. They're s just trying to find a place to rent as a felon is uh, really difficult. So it, it's, it's such a barrier. And what we're doing with Red Lodge is, is we're working the program without the house. Um, we have emergency transportation for people. We have um, people that are mentors. We have people that help um, set up uh, a Pacific program for someone. The majority of our women are going to school. Um, many of them have children. Sure. We work with um, 15 to 20 percent of our clients are men, and I'm pretty particular about who I'll work with. Um, but we, uh, you know, our, our focus is on our women, and we have funding, small <coughs> grants that pay for our programming. We do a lot of uh, supporting of the programs in the prison. We bring a lot of pris programs into our prisons, and then we help engage people in community when they return. Have you served time in prison, Trish? I, I have never been to jail. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been arrested. I'm one of the few. Um, <laughs> Very good, yeah. But I kind of grew up around it. Um, my mom uh, is uh, an attorney, and she did some uh, legal work for uh, the Lakota Club out of the Oregon State Penitentiary when the Lakota Club had their own transition program. And I was going into the prisons when I was 14 or 15 for special events, and so it's um, it doesn't it doesn't scare me. Yeah, when I first went, it, my first visit at uh, OSP in Salem was a little intimidating. I mean, there's so many bars, and and these guys didn't look that friendly at first glance. I mean, I'm sure they were real nice. But after my first visit, I was a lot more comfortable and willing to say hello to anybody, any of the other prisoners, you know, they, they need that social interaction. So I became a lot more friendlier to the prisoners after my first visit, <coughs> realized that they really need that interaction with humans. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of good people that went to prison. The majority of people that go to prison are there because of substance abuse issues. You know, they did something under the influence. 90% um, of the people that we work with have substance abuse issues. So that's a really big piece of what we do is, is uh, <coughs> allow people an opportunity to have a community that is clean and sober to gather. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of really good things coming out of the prisons. There's a lot of good programs. People want to give back. People want to be able to contribute. And this art is, is a part of that. Um, in 2007, we put the word out that we were wanting to have a, a Native American art show. And 10 prisons responded. Um, we've held 10 shows in the last four years. The Native American Prison Art Project uh, continues to travel around the state of Oregon. And we do public education with the art. We talk about incarceration. We talk about the barriers to reentry. Sometimes people come with us and tell their story. And it's a very powerful opportunity uh, for us to use the art um, because the art is such a non-threatening venue and it yeah. allows people to judge someone on their art, not their crime. Yeah. Yes, this one especially from Leonard Peltier. How did you come about, come to acquire that painting? Well, a lot of people love us. Yeah, um, obviously. <laughs> one of Leonard's former defense attorneys donated this original painting to us. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, it is one of my favorites. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. Well, because we're on limited time here, we should probably move on, Trish. Lincoln? Hello. Tell us a little about yourself, if you would, please. First of all, I want to thank you for allowing us to be here, you know, and thank uh, board members of Red Lodge for asking us to represent Red Lodge, and from our point of view, you know, and I consider it a blessing to, to do this, you know. I mean, I'm, one sense, obligated to Red Lodge for what they've done for me. Yeah. I met Red Lodge in when I was incarcerated, and they uh, through this project that originally, but they had helped me. I was a president of the club down there, Native Club, and we did a, a feast that lasts all day, and Red Lodge had contributed to that as well, you know. And, and we had extra funds left from that. We offered to give it back, and they in turn said, go ahead and use that. And so we bought DVDs, things that we needed there, our cultural supplies as well, you know. And, so that was a, a good start there with uh, Red Lodge and us, you know. But then my, uh, myself is, uh, you know, like I said, it's quite an honor to be chosen to speak on behalf of this, you know. I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Red Lodge speaking today. I mean, I would like, no, nah, I'm not going to do nothing, you know. But they've done so much for myself, you know, and actually from from prison, you know, they were there waiting for me and they do give clothes out like they say from their closet and I had dress outs for when I left. I never told anybody I was getting out of prison, I didn't want nobody to know. I wanted the state of Oregon to give me what I had coming, I guess, since I was locked up. It, it's nobody's fault but mine for being there, you know, but when I get out, when I was getting out, I wanted, you're supposed to get money and transportation, what, whatever, you know, they give you. And, they didn't have that for me, you know, to be honest, you know. Trish was there waiting and gave me that ride, you know, to where I needed to go. And actually my health was pretty bad. And uh, I supposed to had oxygen, air, air tank with me, and I didn't get that. Hmm. So I was kind of like stuck, you know, with nothing, you know. And she gave me a ride up to Portland to see my PO. I see my PO, went to NARA. Nara jumped on like, wow, you need oxygen. That's parole officer, for those of you who don't know, PO, parole officer. Yes, parole officer, yes. <laughs> Not everybody knows what that means, Lincoln. I just All right, want to yes. clarify. Thank you, yes. Sorry. <laughs> anyhow, uh, so anyhow, my uh, story goes on to that where Nara, you know, the health clink there, Native American health clink to help me out, and I got sick, you know, caught pneumonia, and Again, I didn't know what was going on. Trish had been there early in the morning, helped me out to get to the hospital, get to the hospital. I didn't even know what was the matter with me. Anyhow, this is my story, you know, from then on, you know, it's, I've been out a year now, and my transition to Red Lodge has been great, in my opinion. I mean, been locked up a significant amount of years, and to get out here is kind of like, what do I do, you know, I mean, there's not too much out here as I expected. I thought there would be a lot, and there kind of isn't in a lot of ways. You have to go out and get it, and you know, I had no access to it, and Trish and her generosity had offered these rides to me to, what, no matter what it was for, to see the parole officer or medical or go to the store or anything, you know? Mm -hmm. So that really did help me. And yeah. Up to this day, you know, like I said, you know, started back in prison. And uh, well, I had an opportunity to, to ride with Trish every now and then. And since then, you know, I've seen what she has done for other people. And she just jumps out and help anybody. No matter if she doesn't question who they are, what they've done, or even if they wasn't incarcerated, I've seen her go out and help people, you know. So I'm like, you know, that is great. And met the rest of the board members there and they are good people there, you know, and they welcome us with open arms, no question, and offer this aid. So with this, you know, I feel very blessed and grateful to be here and absolutely said, sure, I will speak if I could on behalf of Red Lodge, not for myself, on behalf of Red Lodge, you know. And I wish that we could do more, you know, I wish we could, you know, ask for more or whatever, you know, but since we can, uh, you know, this is what I would do if I won the lottery. They wouldn't need a house, so I'd give them the house, you know, but yeah. that's just a dream, you know, but yeah, it's just a seed that's been planted with Red Lodge, and 
-huh. It's growing well, and I think that with any type of help, more from the public or anybody, yeah. they will see more success. Uh -huh. And it is a great successful program, and yeah. the people, ladies, and the guys that, are, that I know that have been there have done well, doing well, and have not violated or whatever to go back into prison. Very few. Have you been able to find work, Lincoln? I, unfortunately, with my health, uh, no, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm very limited, and oh. I, I am on oxygen, should have it on right now, but <laughs> kind of braved it out over here without All right, it tough guy. <laughs> right now, for this moment, yes, you know, blessed, well, you know, as I, I said, you know. Yeah. But no, no yeah. work, and... Okay. But I would do what I could, you know, and mm -hmm. to help anybody, and just like they do, and so Great. here I am. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Lincoln, uh, we need to get to Johnny. Yes. And hear Johnny's story. Tell us about yourself, Johnny, and your relationship with Red Lodge. Well, um, my Aunt Linda Mian has introduced me to Trish because uh, I am freshly out of prison as well. Um, I've been out maybe a good six months, and I called her, and I asked her about two years ago, can you please help me? And Trish is like, okay, well, if you're willing to do the work, I am willing to help you. And so I've been doing everything in my own power to do right, you know. Um, apparent, I'm in treatment at the moment. Uh, Trish is a very supportive lady, really supportive. Um, I can say without her help, I probably would be mm, not very successful today. Um, she's helping me get back into school. Good. Back in the schooling, um, uh, this month I'll be going to PCC, and I've never been. So it's going to be uh, a blessing. Did you get uh, your high school diploma? Um, no. Sir. GED? That's what I'm working on right now. Oh, good. And I'm um, proud to say, you know, I'm really smart, you know? Yeah. And so it won't, I don't think it'll take me very long, so... Oh. Now, did they offer a GED in prison? Can you get your GED there? Yes. Um, while I was in, they told me, well, you know, you're not here long enough. You know, oh. so they, you know, I was in the back of the line while yeah. I was in there. So yeah. only thing I could do is, you know, hope and pray and wait till I get out to do my best. And mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing right now. Have you been able to find work, um, I'm currently looking, currently yeah. looking. Um, yeah. I'm uh, looking for construction or, you know, something movable because then I can't sit still. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'm glad to hear you're getting back into school. Get your GED and then go on to bigger and better things. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, Trish, you put, you put requirements on these people transitioning. They have to meet some requirements that you set to be in the program. Is that true? There are requirements. It is a program. And the resources are, are very valuable. So we do expect people to, to put forth an effort. Um, and I tell everybody that, you know, if you're ready, I'll, I'm here to help you. Mm -hmm. Now, this organization is open to anyone, I presume, to join and to help. Um, we do have about 50 volunteers throughout the state of Oregon yeah. because not everybody comes to Multnomah County. Sure. Uh, and it's really helpful if we know somebody in an area that somebody's going to be releasing to, to try and, and give them somebody that they can have some support from. Uh -huh. We do need volunteers. We're always in... You know, we're always looking for vol volunteers. Um, we're working on our um, our capital campaign right now. And yeah. so, you know, we could certainly use some folks to help us with that. You know, we've got a lot of fundraising ideas and a lot of organization ideas that we will need some help with. Mm -hmm. Well, before I forget, we want to announce uh, one of your upcoming events here. Raise the Red Lodge, a night of comedy and music. Oh, that's old. This, oh, February, oh yeah, this was last, <laughs> oh, February 27th. It was a great show. <laughs> <laughs> this is February, yeah. this was last year. 
Yeah, it was last year. We're hoping to have a show in May. I'm uh, working with a couple of artists right now. Um, one is uh, a NAMI winner, uh, Starnea, we're hoping to have come down. And then a flute player. Um, we're just trying to figure out the venue and, and um, some support for the show, and we hope to have another uh, large fundraiser in May. Good, and we have been showing the scroll for the contact information. I hope, I haven't been watching to see, but we do have your web page that we've been flashing on the screen so people will know how to contact you. <coughs> And I went through the, the web page, and it's very informative, and uh, you guys are doing a lot of things. Uh, it's, I mean, we wouldn't have time here to list all the different projects that you're involved in, but I was really impressed. I'm glad that Red Lodge is out there and that you're working all around the state, too. It's not just here in the local area. It must be difficult to maintain s services in Ontario and... Well, we don't have a lot of services in Ontario. You know, we're lucky if we get a couple of volunteers to that can go out and, and help the men out there um, yeah. with their religious services. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work, but it's also a labor of love. You know, there's a lot of folks that really do appreciate what's being done. Um, one of the things that we're working on is sustainability. And so what you see here in regard to the Native American Prison Art Project has been combined with uh, some community artists that have donated some artwork to us. And we created a nonprofit business called Friends of Red Lodge. And we do have a website for Friends of Red Lodge. We sell cards, calendars, prints. So a lot of the mm -hmm. artwork that you see here, these are originals, but they can be um, obtained in a print form. Yeah, good. And um, do you have, like, give us an idea, wh how much, what are your operating expenses for a year, say? I have a budget of less than $50,000 for a year. And really that just covers the office and, uh, we don't have any paid staff. Everybody's volunteer. I work about 30 hours a week for Red Lodge, and I work uh, my other job about 30 to 35 hours a week. Mm -hmm. wow. um, so we, you know, we have uh, expenses for travel and gas, mm -hmm. um, community programs, prison programs. Mm -hmm. The majority of the funding goes toward uh, the women. <coughs> Well, we're getting notice here that we're running out of time for our program, so uh, <laughs> we need to wrap it up. If you uh, are in prison today, this is the people to look for. Red Lodge will help you make the transition, especially for women. This is, you have more of an emphasis on women, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, thank you very much for watching our show. We'll be back next month the third Thursday of March, and we're going to have a gentleman musician, native musician, playing guitar. I forgot his name, sorry, but uh, thanks for watching, and we'll be back next month.